So today I, I like to talk about density matrix or density operator. But before I do that, uh, I like to talk on something that's very important to quantum mechanics. Which is the topic of uh, quantum interpretation. The subject of quantum interpretation is something very controversial, but yet very important for you to understand quantum mechanics. If you do not understand quantum interpretation, you would not be able to understand quantum mechanics. So, we say if we have a quantum system, the state of the quantum system is defined by a state vector or a wave function. This state vector can manifest itself as a wave function, it can manifest itself as a column vector of numbers, it could manifest itself in very many different ways. It's very much like the vector you used to describe the state of a factory. If you have control theories and you're going to describe the state of a factory to somebody, you give that guy a whole bunch of numbers on the factory, like the temperature, the number of workers, the number of machines that are running, the number of machines that are not running, and so on. So the state vector can be thought of as something like that. It's a wave function that describes the state at which the quantum system is there. In often time, we say a state vector is a linear superposition of perhaps two state vectors, like psi1 plus a2 psi2. And we have this um, normalization condition that all state vectors normalize to 1 for probabilistic interpretation, and that uh, we would likewise have this kind of requirement that this should be 1. This should be 1 for normalization condition. And because of this normalization condition, you also have the additional fact that a1 squared plus a2 squared equals to 1. Then what is the meaning of a1 squared and a2 squared? a1 squared interprets the property, the probability, of the quantum system being in state one, and A2 squared expresses the probability of the quantum system being in state two. Okay, what does this probability mean? It's a very bizarre concept in quantum mechanics, but perhaps it cannot be related to something that we're used to in everyday life, which means that if this quantum state is in the linear superposition of these two states, it could actually be simultaneously in these two states. Okay. And before you do the measurement on the quantum system, you do not actually know what state it is in. And if you perform the measurement, you'll find that uh, after many measurements, the probability of it being in state 1 is given by A1 squared. The probability of finding the result, if you are able to do measurements, Okay, to, this, to determine what state the quantum system is in, you'll find that this is the outcome. This is the outcome of the experiment. You'll find that quantum systems always give rise to, give rise to random outcomes. Okay, like uh, the Stern-Gerlach experiment that uh, I talked about, that if you pass, say, something through a magnetic thing, a beam of uh, silver atoms or something, and you would have it deflected into half spin up and half spin down thing. Okay? And we say that the quantum system is in a linear superposition of spin up state plus spin down state. There's one way to write this, okay, with a little bit of abuse of notation because this is a state vector and those are matrix uh, vectors, and that you'll find that uh, if it's in the spin-up state, then this, this has the probability of uh, 1 over root 2. This will have something of a 1 over root 2, and it has a chance of half and half that you find that the spin is up and the spin is down. Okay, if you do experiment at one silver atom at a time, one silver atom at a time, it turns out that the number of spin-up Silver atom has a chance of being 50% found with spin up. 
And if you do one simple atom at a time, you'll find that 50 percent time of the outcome turns out to be bad. Okay? And then any spin up system, any spin up system can be again written as a linear superposition of uh, a spin pointing in the x direction plus a spin pointing in the uh, I think it's something like that. Okay. The thing this is this describes a spin pointing in the x direction and the spin <coughs> pointing in the y direction may be missing some i somewhere. Okay. So if you were to split this state vector again, okay, it can be written as a kind of uh, pointing in the x direction. I'm sorry, it's minus x direction and x direction. Okay, let me call it B1, B2, minus x direction. Okay. If you were to do an experiment by aligning the stern up experiment pointing out of the blackboard, you'll find that half of this atom will point in the x direction in one way, half of this atom will be found pointing in the y direction. Okay. So this gives rise to the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics. The fact that these are the probabilistic amplitudes when you square them. Okay? And before you square them, you do not really know what state the quantum system is in. It's actually in a linear superposition of two states. So before we are able to do uh, perform another stern gerlach experiment with the experimental axis pointing out of the blackboard, you do not know whether it is actually pointing in the inside the blackboard or outside the blackboard. Okay, so this is a bizarre condition. So, so how does one interpret this then? Before a measurement, you do not know what state of quantum system is in. After the measurement, you know what it is in. So this gives rise to the concept of collapsing of a quantum system. After the measurement, you do not know what state it is in, but after the measurement, if you found that it is in state one, you say that it collapsed to this state. Okay. After measurement, if you found it to be in that case, you say the quantum system is described by this state function. There's a concept of collapsing, and before you do the measurement, you do not know what it is actually. Uh, what it is actually. So it is actually in the linear superposition of these two states. Okay. That is something very bizarre, and nobody wants to accept that for a long time. Even Einstein did not want to accept this fact. That before you do the measurement, you do not know what state the quantum system is in. So he actually talked to his friend and said, if this is really true, if I don't look at the moon, is the moon still there? OK, this is what quantum interpretation. It means that if you don't look at the moon, you actually do not know if the moon is there. If the moon is in the east, south, northwest direction. You do not know where it is. Okay, so it defies all our classical intuition about measurement systems. Okay, there's one very important thing. And then Schrodinger himself uh, cooked up an experiment called the Schrodinger cat experiment, okay, which is also very bizarre. Uh, he says that uh, if you have a cake, say if you have a cat in there, a cat, Schrodinger cat, maybe something like that. Okay. Schrodinger cat in there, with a whisper. Okay? And then you do an experiment, and then there's some, maybe cyanide gas, a flask that holds some cyanide gas. And the cyanide gas flask is connected to some trigger. And the trigger could be triggered by a subatomic event. Maybe there's a radioactive decay that happens 50% of the time. Say in one day, the chance of having a radioactive decay from an experiment is 50% time, 50% uh, of the chance. 50% of the chance you would not get a radioactive uh, particle hitting that trigger. And if that radioactive particle hits the trigger, it switches it on and it breaks the flask, and the flask will is the cyanide gas, and the cat is dead. Okay? And 50% of the chance that doesn't happen. Sure, sure, in the say, if I cannot see this cat, and before I open the cage, at the end of the day, 
what is the state of the cat? Is it a dead cat or an alive cat? And according to the quantum interpretation, the cat should be in the linear superposition of a dead state plus an alive state. You do not know what state it is in. It's dead plus alive. Okay? And only after you open the cage and look at it, it collapses into one of the two states. And this is extremely bizarre. Okay, this is extremely bizarre. What we know with our modern understanding of quantum mechanics, this doesn't happen. Okay, this, I'll explain to that later on. So, Einstein did not like this kind of interpretation where you do not know what the state is in before you do the measurement. He come up with the, the even variable theory. Okay, his hidden variable theory is that even be, before we do the measurement, the quantum system has already collapsed into one of the two states. It's only that it is in one of these two states in a probabilistic fashion. Okay, that it will come out to be exactly as we found in the experiment. It will be, it will have collapsed into this quantum state with p1 probability. It will have collapsed into this system with p2. P2 probability, but it does it in a very random fashion, okay? And that random fashion is controlled by some hidden variable in the background, which we do not know, okay? So, he had this hidden variable theory, which actually is very good because it agrees with the intuition. It agrees with the intuition that the moon is still there before you look at it, or after you look at it, it's still there. Okay, so a lot of classical Phenomenon agrees with the hidden variable theory. Okay, but then there's another school of thought which actually proposes the other interpretation. The other interpretation is called the Copenhagen school. Led by Niels Bohr. He actually was in this other interpretation called a quantum interpretation which says that you do not know what a quantum state is in before you actually uh, do the measurement. Okay? So, the modern interpretation is this. Um, there is the concept of a quantum coherence. Quantum coherence means that a quantum state can be in a linear superposition of two states only. If these two numbers, A1 and A2, are in perfect phase coherence. Okay, they're in perfect phase coherence, and that is not possible for all systems. It is possible for very many microscopic and atomic systems, but not for all systems. Okay? So if A1 and A2 are related to each other by a random phase, then they don't have quantum coherence. But if they are related to each other by a precise phase, then they're in quantum coherence, and then you should think of a quantum state being in the linear superposition of two states. That is not possible in the classical world, but it is possible in the atomic world. Say if we define a, a simple electron by, by this wave function, the interpretation is that the electron can be anywhere in this space before we do the measurement. Okay? And in order for it to maintain quantum coherence, the phase factor for the wave function here and the wave function here has to be in complete coherence. So you can think of this as being a linear superposition of position states. This is a position state, right? So you can think of it as, as that, okay? Or in, in typical. These are the position state of the electron in the coordinate representation. And the position has to be related to each other by a perfect phase before we can describe it with a wave function. If you lose phase coherence, you will lose this phase factor over here. Okay, and then all these electrons that are in different places are not in phase coherence, and then you would have, say that the electron has collapsed to one of the positions or the place where you have found the measurement, okay? So I like to liken this kind of thing to, in the real world, only angels and ghosts 
can do that. Like if I need you that simultaneously you can be sitting here and there. Okay? I do not know where you're sitting. You can be there and you can be here. Humans cannot do that, but ghosts and angels can do that, right? You read ghost stories. Ghosts can be anywhere in this room and you don't know where they are. So quantum particles have that nature and that capability of being everywhere before you do the measurement. It can be in any of the two states before you do the measurement. Only after you've done the measurement, it collapses to one of the two states. Okay? So the final test of the pudding between the uh, hidden variable theory and the Copenhagen School of Interpretation is actually Bell's theorem. Bell was actually a great admirer of Einstein. He actually came up with this theorem that if Einstein is correct, all the experimental outcome would lean one way. If the if Einstein's theory is wrong and the Copenhagen School of Interpretation is correct, then the experiment will be in the other way. So there's an inequality. A equals to B kind of A greater than or B. We will talk about this Bell theorem at the end of the course when we talk about quantum information. Okay? So if Einstein's theory is correct, all the experiments will be in one way. If the Copenhagen School of Interpretation is correct, the experiment will be in the other way. It turns out that the Copenhagen School won. Okay. Experiments are not done until the 1980s. Not were done until the 1980s. And they were always done with photons. If you read all the experiments that were done to confirm Bell's theorem, he actually was in favor of Einstein. He designed this mathematical inequality to favor Einstein, he hoped. But then all the outcome tend to favor the other school. Okay? And uh, physicists like to call this the most important theorem of the last century. But unfortunately, he died before he could be awarded a Nobel Prize. Okay? So he, his work was that important. It was something out of his surprise. He couldn't believe that. That means he had to think of quantum particles as ghosts. Okay? They can actually flip up between the two states. And not knowing which state it is in before you do the math. Okay? We'll talk about Bell's theorem at the end of the course. But today I'd like to talk about are there any questions on this? Okay? How does we get rid of the paradox with the Schrodinger's cat then? It turns out that you can describe the Schrodinger cat with the date state and the, the live state. But it's very difficult to keep these two states in quantum coherence. Okay, a cat is made of millions and millions of molecules and atoms. And it's very difficult for those atoms and molecules to act together to become a large quantum particle with a fixed phase relationship between them. So when you think about a Schrodinger cat, it's not able to have a date state that is in coherence with a live cat. And hence, this A1 and A2 becomes random variables. Uh, they have a very random phase. And you cannot think of them as being a linear superposition of two cats, date and the line. OK, that's the modern understanding of the Schrodinger cat paradox. There are a lot of systems like that in the quantum world that things have already collapsed to some definite state before you do the math. Okay, and then you would not have this kind of paradoxes. But in many quantum systems, you should think of them as being linear superposition of states before you do the measurement. And they're actually quantum coherent with respect to each other. Okay, are there any questions regarding this? So it's something quite bizarre, something that you would not be used to, but slowly it has to sink in so that you can understand this uh, quantum interpretation well. So let's talk about the... Well, so another saying that Einstein says <coughs> is that God does not play dice. So this quantum interpretation must be wrong. Okay, it's too, too, too probabilistic. So let's talk about the density operator. The density operator is a good operator <coughs> because uh, 
It is a way of describing a quantum state. Sometimes it's also called a matrix that includes both pictures. That includes pictures of what we call pure quantum state or mixed quantum state. A pure quantum state is a state where the state is in complete quantum coherence and it can be described by this wave function. A mixed state is a state where you have a mixture of both. Some of this, like if you have an ensemble of atoms, atoms in a laser system, and the atoms might not be in the exact quantum state, they might, some of the atoms might have collapsed into one excited state, and some of them might have collapsed into ground states. And some of them might be in the linear superposition of two states, excited and ground states. Okay, those are called mixed states. And the density matrix is a way to describe that. And as I said before, this is something that describes the state of a quantum system. The density operator uses exactly the same wave function, but you take an outer product and convert this into an operator. Okay. So this acts on the vector, it gives you another vector. So this must be an operator. This must be an operator, because as you can see, it acts in another vector to give you back a vector. Okay, this is just a vector, or a state vector. Okay, so this must be an operator. And then this is actually very similar to, if we were to use matrix, matrix notation, this is very similar to like, a vector u, conjugate transpose times another vector u. Okay, this is very similar to that. Okay, this is just the Hilbert space representation of that. And then as we said before, uh, if you were to wanting to find the state of uh, expectation value of an operator, what we do usually there is to just calculate this value. Okay, that's the expectation of an operator and how we should do that. And if we were to do this in matrix notation, given in matrix operator A, and if you'd like to find the expectation value of that, we'll do something like U conjugate transpose A dot U. Okay, these two notations are entirely analogous to each other. Okay. And we can write this out, for instance, as we have done before, in terms of index notation is u i conjugate a i j, and then u j. Right? This is actually equal to that sum over i and j. That is what the inner product means. You can arrange the inner product in different order and say that this is i, j, u, j, u, i. You can arrange things in this order, still summing over that. I mean, think of this as a matrix operator. Okay. And actually, let me see what I did here. Oh, this should be the opposite. Okay, this should be the other way around. This is this one, outer product. Okay, not the other way around. So then this thing is just equal to the IJ element of the density matrix. Okay, this is, this is the IJ element of the density matrix. And from that you can see that that is equal to AIJ pro JI. IJ. So one of them forms the inner product, the other one forms a trace. The outer sum comes over the outermost in this. So this is the same as the trace of a row. Okay, can everybody see that? So what happens is that if you would extend this to direct notation, then the expectation of the operator 
is just equal to the trace of the operator times the density operator. Okay, if you extend this to using the reciprocation and Hilbert space, that is the formula for trace. So how do we calculate the trace of an operator in Hilbert space? Hilbert space then. Well, you calculate the trace by projecting it onto any complete orthonormal basis set. Okay, I can find the matrix element of this, okay, by projecting onto a complete and orthonormal basis set where Bn is orthonormal and complete, okay, Pn has that property. And this is how you find, you find the matrix representation of this operator and then sum up the diagonal element. That is what it means. A general matrix representation of that operator would be just this. Okay, this would be like the n n alum. Okay, this is the general matrix representation of this operator, and if some of the diagonal elements that gives you the trace. And this formula works because this formula is basis independent as long as the basis set is completely <coughs> orthonormal. And you can prove this very easily. I can easily form an identity element with another basis set say psi m psi m okay this gives me the identity operator and I can insert this somewhere in between <coughs> okay I can insert this somewhere in between I believe I can put this somewhere right there and make this into something like psi m Psi n. Psi n. A row. <coughs> um, psi m, right? Yeah, psi m. Then they can take this piece, take this piece and put it there. Okay, so this will be m and n. If I take this piece and put it there, I would have psi n together with psi n. So I would have something that looks like this. Psi n, psi n, psi n, right, m and n. But this forms an identity operator. I can collapse it and remove it. I can remove it and then what I have then is that the uh, I would have the trace of a hat rho hat can also be written as psi m a hat rho hat psi m. If I collapse this piece and take it away, okay. So you see that the trace of an operator is independent of the basis that you choose. Okay. It's independent of the basis that you choose and hence it doesn't matter whether you pick psi phi or psi as long as the basis set is complete in a form or more and that uh, you can form an identity operator with it okay so Time you can also, for instance, write this in terms of um, you can put another identity operator in there. Um, A psi n psi n pro hat.
I can put another identity operator in there. Okay, and this is just the matrix representation of this operator n. So this is a m n, which I can write it as a matrix a, and then this is the matrix representation of the density operator, and I can just write it as such. And hence, this can also be written as a trace of the matrix representation times the other matrix representation. Okay, so you also can write this formula in terms of matrix representations. If you know how to calculate the matrix of this system, you know how to calculate the matrix of this operator, you can write the trace as such. Okay? Are there any questions so far? Things are all right, right? And also, this is order independent. You can also write this as rho dot a. Doesn't matter. You can easily prove that the trace of the product of two matrices is independent of the order. Because the uh, trace is a, i, j, b, j, i, sum over j, sum over i. It doesn't matter which order you put this in. Apparently the same as trace of B A. Okay. Are there any questions so far about the density operator? The good thing about the density operator is that it uses this to represent the state of a quantum system instead of this, and if there's any relative, and if there's any absolute phase, they will cancel out, because this is the, the complex conjugate of this. This is like the complex conjugate of this. So the density operator only depends on the relative phases in this outer product. Whereas this, you need absolute phase. Absolute phase has no meaning in quantum mechanics. You can always add a phase in quantum mechanics and not change the wave function. So in that sense, the density operator is a more succinct notation because you get rid of absolute phase requirement. You only need relative phases. So we can look at the original quantum system that we had. We say that this quantum system is described by this state vector. And if we look at the density operator, it comes out of this. Okay. If you do the outer product, then you have A1 psi 1 plus a2 psi 2 multiplying with the formation conjugate of that, which is um, psi 1, a1 complex conjugate plus psi 2, a2 complex conjugate. And then you just multiply them out, you get four terms. If you multiply out the four terms, you have psi 1, psi 1 times a1 magnitude square. This is this cross term. Okay, and then you have these other terms that give you psi 2, psi 2, a2 magnitude square. And then you have the cross terms. The cross terms are like psi 1, psi 2, a1, a2 conjugate. Plus this other cross term, which is psi two, psi one, a two, a one conjugate. Okay, so this is the density operator expressed uh, explicitly, and you can see that relative phases are important only, not absolute phases. If there's any absolute phase that has gone into a one and a two, they will have cancel out. This one has no absolute phase dependence, and this only depends on the relative phases between the, the two states. Okay, this is a pure quantum state. And if this is not pure, then 
these two will be related to each other by a random phase. And if you have a random phase between these two quantities, and if you were to either time average this quantity or ensemble average these two quantities, they will average to zero because they are uncorrelated. Okay, so if this describes a mixed state where the quantum system has already collapsed into either this one or that one, this two will ensemble average to zero. Okay, so if we have a mixed state instead, okay, if we have a mixed state. Then we can say that the ensemble average of A2, A1, A2 conjugate is zero. The ensemble average of A2, A1 conjugate is equal to zero. Then the quantum system is described by this density operator, which is a little bit simplified. Because then it will just be the probability of finding it in state one P1, okay, the probability of finding it in state one plus the probability of finding it in state two. Okay, this is what a mixed state is. The density operator for mixed state is a lot simplified. And then in general, you can describe a mixed state density operator as the summations of its probability to be in different quantum states. This is a mixed state. Yes? Uh, well, this, this, uh, average of A1 and 